five, four, three, two, one. Blast wow. off. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just want to welcome everybody tonight to the event, uh, to the Science Activities event. Um, it's uh, the topic is uh, Space Shuttle and Beyond, and it's a really, top, it's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart because all of our guest speakers are very dear friends of mine, and I've had the privilege of working with them and collaborating together for many years at a lot of different space festivals and different events. Um, and uh, they're just uh, they're just the best. So, and I can't thank them enough for participating tonight. Um, joining us from Monterey is let's see here, uh, Dan Bursch, former NASA astronaut, and from um, Maryland is Ed Rizak, who is a um, former aerospace systems engineer. From Somewhere on the road in Texas, <laughs> between Fort Worth and Houston, is Greg Johnson, also known as Box, his call sign, and uh, he is a it, it, he is a former NASA astronaut as well. Yeah. And then joining us from San Diego is our moderator tonight, which is Francis French, who is a award winning um, author and a frequent lecturer for uh, space history and moderator, of course. And he has co-written several books with the astronauts uh, with their biographies, one which is a national bestseller. So Francis, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thanks everybody for coming tonight. And thank you. Thanks, Jeb. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Deb. Thanks so much. If I could ask everybody who's not a speaker to mute themselves if you can, otherwise we're gonna hear every clink of a glass, every glass of champagne you're, you're enjoying tonight. Um, we'll, we'll hear all that. So. If I could ask everybody to do that, that would be great. Um, so yes, we have such a wonderful lineup tonight. Um, I'd love to start with, I'm gonna go relentlessly alphabetically tonight, um, start with Dan. I mean, mm -hmm. Dan has over 17 years of flight related test and evaluation experience, 26 years of project oriented leadership, which is amazing. Cause if you look at him on the screen, he's only 20 years old. Um, four <laughs> flights in space, one long duration crew member, international space station. I mean, just an incredible, incredible career. I mean. One thing I've noticed though, Dan, in your former and current work is you, you always talk about teamwork during your ISS time, so many different cultures, so many different countries. And of course you've had a record breaking time on the ISS in your last mission there. Can you tell us a little bit how good examples of that kind of culture of cooperation and also what does that tell us now for the future as we start looking at lessons learned from ISS? Yeah, it's the, um... Uh, it's a tough thing bringing people from all, all over the world and, and working together. And actually the first uh, introduction I had to how tough it was, was just the early parts of, of um, the space station program and, uh, and getting the different people to work together. I mean, we, we, we actually went through culture training classes at NASA uh, to learn the differences between the Russian culture and US culture. I'll give you one example. Um, in the Russian culture, uh, they basically said, if you're at a meeting and, and the head person isn't there, nothing will be decided. I mean, they don't really delegate too much to, to other people. So just a difference in how, how they operate. So, and I truly feel that, that the uh, most uh, important word for, of the International Space Station is the fact that it's international. I mean, it's hard. But um, when you can work together and bring a team together, uh, great things happen. Uh, I, I remember there is a quote by Cal Ripken that talked about teamwork. And if I can remember that, uh, I'll uh, bring it up later. But it's an excellent quote about bringing people from different cultures together and, 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 and uh, working as a team. Thanks. Right. Wise words now, especially in we're, we're a very interesting time politically with Russia. So um, I oh, hope yeah. those words uh, endure and continue. Um, yeah. I'll move over to, it says Greg's iPhone on here, but I can't call him Greg, he's Box Johnson. Um, he currently looks like he's been pulled over in an episode of Cops, but that is because um, <laughs> he is now, has gone from being a test pilot, an astronaut, now he's a, back at Lockheed Martin Aero and he was flying jets again today. He's back to being a test pilot and he's on the road for this call, which is wonderful. Um, he and I were talking a little bit earlier and uh, we were talking about how the ISS is something where he went for short duration missions. Dan was up there for a long time, um, but we can, we can talk about that or we can talk about this great video we're seeing on screen right now and looking at the ISS and how it rotates. Well, you know, I, I think we, we can probably do both, Francis. Um, this just kind of gives you a visual of the space station. 
uh, that Dan lived on for months. Uh, and uh, my, my flights were on the shuttle, so we just visited for a couple weeks at a time. But it's an amazing facility. And you know, the inter international cooperation, uh, even on my short mission, uh, went up there and uh, Dimitri was uh, the, a Russian MiG-29 pilot who was the commander of the space station and also the commander of the Soyuz, the vehicle that they, the Russians traveled to and from the space station. And he had never been in a shuttle. Uh, but more importantly, what I kind of didn't elaborate on is he was a MiG-29 pilot during the Cold War and I was an F-15 pilot. And so we were trained you know, as adversaries uh, during the Cold War. And it was really professionally satisfying to me to see Dimitri embrace with him when I first got to the space station. He'd never been in a shuttle. He came over, we sat in the pilot and the commander's seats and just shared 30 minutes of, wow, you know, he says, this looks just like the Russian Baran, which, which was a, a, a Russian space sh uh, shuttle that looked a lot like our shuttles. And it was kind of interesting. Today, I was flying a Russian airplane. Actually, it was a Czechoslovakian airplane. Uh, and it had Cyrillic in, in it. And it kind of reminded me of when I sat in the Braun. But, but I never saw politics ever get up to the International Space Station. Even during those tough times, uh, you know, several years ago, uh, I never got to live there, but I've spent about 30 days. I'm jealous of Dan for having lived up there for so long. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so it, it's a wonderful thing that we can do together in this, in this, in this world uh, when we collaborate, get along, uh, and um, have a common, common goal, which is sort of what we're trying to do here to get over COVID. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful insight box. And, and I love the fact that you're taking out the time having flown jets all morning to get us on the road with this long trip. It's really kind of you to join us too. Well, um, you know, so I'm in a truck stop, just so you know, and I, this is the best lighting I could find in the middle of nowhere south of Dallas, Texas. But I, I'm, I apologize for um, the, the, bad, uh, the bad video. And honestly, the plan was not to fly twice today. And who's- Here once or my Ily once. So- Anyway, at that point, I'll just, I'll stop talking. Yeah. Now your your uh, Zoom call in a truck stop is better than most of us can do on our laptops. So I'm, uh, I'm impressed. No wonder they picked you. Um, let's go to our third guest here, continuing with our relentless uh, alphabetical order, so Ed Rizak. Um, the astronauts always talk about how the people on the ground are so important. And I mean, Ed has done everything, space development, training, pro and all kinds of procedures for some of the shuttle EVA's most fiendishly difficult tasks, particularly repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. Basically, everything that people do in space, um, they, they needed these support posts on the ground, and Ed is the guy. I mean, amazing, amazing stuff. And, and every astronaut talks about how they, it would not be possible to do things without that kind of teamwork and cooperation and training on the ground. Um, Ed, I was talking to Bruce McCandless III last night. Uh, he was here in San Diego, and he, we were talking about Bruce McCandless II, his father, who, um, of course, made that very first untethered EVA in the man maneuvering unit. And we were talking about like the, the early years of the shuttle, which you were our only person involved in here um, that I understand because there was that kind of Wild West era from 1981 to 85 where Solar Max was out there. You were working on that, you know, get it, strap on a, on a jet pack, go mm -hmm. out, pick it up, bring it back. I mean, just amazing kind of stuff and ideas. And you were in the middle of all that. What was that like? It was kind of crazy because, uh, <clears throat> you know, th th we, uh, we pay a lot of attention to lessons learned. Uh, but we didn't have any back then. So we were kind of making it up uh, on the fly. Um, I just finished reading Bruce's book, by the way. Uh, uh, worked with his dad uh, on the uh, STS-41B. That was the precursor to the solar maximum uh, repair, the first uh, untethered flight of the MMU. So it was... Um, it was interesting and it was, it was all blue sky. Uh, what was nice to not, you know, in addition to not having the lessons learned, we also didn't have any rules. Uh, we kind of uh, were free to uh, be creative. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun with the tools. Uh, again, the, the Bruce McCandless two uh, flight of the MMU was the precursor to uh Pinky and Ox going up just 
two months after that to repair the solar maximal satellite. And uh, it was a just, just very, very exciting time. Still is. Mm-hmm. Can, I can only imagine. Um, and thank you for everything you did. Cause I mean, the, the work and continue to do cause the work that happened in those years was that was my space program. Other people remember the Luna stuff, but those years that, that was when I was really getting into it. So I'm, uh, yeah. I'm very grateful you did what you did. Thanks. Let's circle back to Dan here. Um, I was I was reading this book of Dan's earlier, which is uh, Up to the Moon, um, which is the it's a children's book. So finally, here's a here's a book I can actually read and understand. And there's nice big pictures for me to to do. Having gone from working on the most most expensive, most fiendishly complicated international piece of engineering ever, what just made you decide to do a huge pivot and go work on a children's book, Dan? What what are you trying to Get across uh, by deciding well, to do I have, this. I have to say, Sharon, Sharon did most of the work. So, you know, and I, I was uh, more of an advisor and did some of the artwork in the book, but uh, Sharon did all of the, all the illustration using a, a, an app called uh, Paper uh, on, on her iPad. And, and uh, yeah, she did great work. And, and uh, I know, I mean, the thing about books is, and that we learned very quickly is, and you probably know too, Francis, is, it's just, it's just fun. I mean, and maybe uh, children, I wanted to start out, it's kind of like coaching baseball, right? I started out and coaching five-year-olds and, you know, you want to start a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit in, on the easy side, but anyways, um, yeah, I mean, it was just, that's all I can say. It's, it's just fun and, and working with Sharon, my wife, Sharon, uh, doing it was, was just a lot of fun. So um, yeah, thanks. I know the feeling. I, I see Michelle Rausch, my uh, co-author on our children's book, is on, is on the call here, too. So um, she probably would not describe everything we did as fun. A lot of it was some pretty hard work there with the art, but we, uh, the end result yeah. was, was wonderfully fun. Yeah. And I have to say, you and Sharon are the best uh, karaoke singing duo I've ever seen in the astronaut oh, okay. office. You, so that you have three careers now, astronaut, All children's right. book author, and, and a singer, which is, which is wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, Box, you know, we were we were talking a little bit earlier about um, the kind of the Wild West era of the shuttles. And of course, we had two tragic accidents, which really changed that um, whole culture. And um, you, of course, were a key member of working out what happened to the Columbia shuttle, that foam strike that uh, doomed the orbiter. And we're talking about not just the shuttle and what was happening at the time, but also, you know, lessons learned. What can the folks now working on these new um, generation of space vehicles learn from things like that? particularly as you were kind of in the eye of the hurricane for learning what happened on that shuttle and how that could not be rooted. So um, I'm having a little bit of audio. Do you, do you hear me loud and clear? A little audio difficulty going on. Okay, okay. so yeah, all right. So it's probably on my end. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I've, I've started rolling only because I'm still four hours outside of Houston. I'm trying not to get there after midnight. Um, but so we had a lot to learn. One thing is that space flight is not easy. And although we expected the space shuttle to be more routine, uh, we expected originally to fly 12 times a year. Um, and, and there's so much to, to learn. There, it, space flight is hard. We also learned that when we failed, we didn't give up. And um, we got better. And the second, the second uh, shuttle failure was before I got my first flight. And, and so, so I, um, when Columbia came back, we all came together and the plan was to, you know, learn, learn from it and grow from it. But I, at the time, I didn't think that we'd really fly again. I was, I was worried that we wouldn't, but the value of those astronauts who sacrifice their live lives is, it would be so significant. And, we all banded together and we stood on the shoulders of giants and the shuttles that we had at the very end were the best shuttles of, of the entire program. So um, while failure is, um, is difficult, you know, everything in life carries risk. I think it's probably more dangerous to drive in Houston than it is to fly in the space shuttle. So, um, but, I, and I don't know how well you can hear me because I, I think I might be breaking up, but in any case, uh, it's a very valuable endeavor. We're just scratching the surface and now we're starting to fly commercial uh, space, space vehicles. Um, and it, it, we're just lucky to be a part of it. We can hear you well, Greg. 
I can hear you totally fine, Greg. So I um, really appreciate that that insight. And it sounds like you had the same Uber driver in Houston I had last time. Oh boy, yeah, that was a uh, that was an experience. Um, let's circle back again to to Ed. I mean, you you are probably most famed for your work on Hubble. Um, you, it's been likened to brain surgery wearing oven gloves, and and how you were able to train people to do that is, is incredible. But you're also you work for so much insight stuff on um, some of those long duration shuttle missions and stuff on the station, looking at the effects of long duration on the human body. Lessons we have to learn if we're going to go anywhere else outside of low orbit, we're going to have to learn that stuff. So what what did we learn from this shuttle station era we, we have lived through and continue to live in with the station? And what do we still need to learn? What are the key things we still need to work out? Oh, my gosh, uh, we we're continuing to learn, you know, uh, I remember early on, uh, when I was in Houston, I was working for the uh, uh, life sciences uh, division at, at J Johnson. And, uh, you know, so much of what we do not only benefits uh, the women and men that are going into space on, uh, you know, our planned uh, extended duration flights, uh, but there's a benefit here. Somebody told me once that uh, the uh, un uh, understanding uh, normal human physiology in the abnormal environment of space leads to a better understanding of abnormal human physiology mm -hmm. here on Earth. And and uh, you know we're we're just not only are we uh, benefiting our next generation of astronauts who we hope to send to Mars and beyond. But we're also bringing that, that Earth benefit home to uh, some of the medications, some of the, the understanding, uh, better understanding we have of human physiology. Uh, had a lot of fun working with uh, the space lab missions, uh, life sciences missions in particular. Uh, so uh, yeah, do, do we have all the answers yet? Certainly not. But uh, I think we're in better shape today than we were in 1981 when uh, the shuttle program started. So if we were to go to Mars, what do we still need to know? What, how far away are we from understanding those effects on the human body to be able to go anywhere else? Is there still a lot we've got to learn or are we getting closer? Oh, I, yeah, we're getting closer. I'll uh, yield to uh, my buddies who have been uh, on space station. But, uh, you know, we're going to have to take a lot of, of our nutrition with us. Uh, we're, so we've been doing experiments on uh, growing crops in space. Uh, uh, again, better understanding of human physiology. Uh, but we've got other things, it's not just what's happening to the, uh, the human body during those long durations, but uh, so we, we need a better understanding of uh, how to protect ourselves from radiation. Uh, and so that's, that's driving some vehicle spacecraft design as well. So uh, yeah, I don't think we're, we're quite ready to make that, that trip yet. That's why I think going to the moon, you know, returning to the moon is probably so important. We've got a beautiful lab uh, just, you know, right over our heads and, uh, God forbid something goes South, we can get there quicker than we could if something went wrong on the Martian surface. So, uh, I think it's very important that we start utilizing, uh, the, the lunar surface again, uh, that'll, uh, that will push our understanding or increase our understanding of long duration stays. And, and like I said, it's a beautiful laboratory. We've got it sitting right above us. That's fascinating, particularly your point about how a lot of people don't realize the stuff that happens in space has direct medical impacts right here on Earth. But you make a good point, too, that we have people on this call who've actually lived on that space station. We should probably turn to one of those, too. Uh, Dan, mm -hmm. you, you were the on what was, as I recall, only the fourth expedition to the space station. You know, this is 2001, 2002. This is really early in the life of the space station. There's, there are people working at NASA now who were not born or were being born when you were up there, which is a terrifying thought to me, but I'm, I'm, it's true. It's been two decades. Um, 
what what have you as you've been following the station what was it like then and what's changed what is it like now that's really changed over those two decades of, of occupancy yeah I th um well i first want to i i want to circle back to the cal ripkin quote that that um i i uh, i looked up and he said that chemistry is bringing individual talents together to now work as a team and he said that in industry, it's it's typically or sometimes called culture. So it's really difficult. There are some a lot of analogies between um, if you look at uh, sports teams and bringing people from all over that grew up in different that have different value systems, right? Even within our own country, there's all over they have different value systems. Bringing people together to do that. So I think that the biggest difference was. In the early days of space station, there was so much change. I mean, I mean, even crews. I was at one time I was on Expedition Two, then I was on Expedition Four. At one time I was on Expedition Three. I mean, it, it just there was so much uncertainty as as we kind of worked uh, worked together. So that would be probably one of the biggest uh, differences. I'm really jealous of those people up there now that have the cupola. I mean, the cupola oh, yeah. is, is just like, my gosh, it's like if there would be one thing up there that I could go and I could go, I would just spend my whole time uh, looking out the cupola as long as it was faced towards Earth. And, and probably if it was towards out of outer space, I'd deal with, with it, too. So that was probably one of the biggest um, uh, changes, I think, and just the uncertainty in the program. And now it's kind of, you know, it's kind of regular people, the training. That was the other thing is the training. Uh, we went through about a year and a half of, of uh, uh, actually, I would say almost three years of training. And uh, even the training they were trying to figure out, like, um, you know, the Russians were responsible for training us on the Russian hardware, U.S. Re uh, training us on the U.S. hardware. A uh, little antidote or a little story is uh, for everyone is that uh, what I learned quickly was that even though the international, the, the, the official language on the International Space, Station, uh, international Space Station was supposed to be English, um, we found out that when we took exams uh, in Russia, if you spoke their language, they were much nicer to you. I mean, if you tried to speak their language, they were like, okay, he's trying to speak our language, well, be much nicer to him. And if you relied on an interpreter, they were all over it. I mean, so anyways, it, it was just, it's a cultural, it's a respect thing, I, I think. And, and um, it's just uh, working with uh, different people. But um, to sum it up, I think that would be that there was just a lot of changes uh, going on, I would say almost monthly, of whether it was training or, or crew assignments and, and things like that. But, um, uh, and I'm trying to, and I had one more point and I forgot, but I'll remember. That was it. <laughs> We'll get back to you, and you're reminding me. One of these days, I need to stop speaking English and learn how to speak American, but uh, it's, it's not happened yet. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Greg can still hear us, but you. Oh, are, I can hear um, you. Course, yeah, I've got wonderful. a tag on with the cupola. Yeah, the yes, the I, cupola. please do. So, so Dano, um, my shuttle flights were late in the program, 2008 and 2011. So the first flight, there was no cupola, and at the time, uh, we were considering because we had the accident in in 2003 we were considering the rack and stack of the modules of the space station and at one time it got down to seven plus one seven more shuttle flights to go to the space station and one hubble servicing mission and at that time the cupola didn't make the list oh and so i was talking to my sister about that who's an architect and she told me oh greg the the cupola a window is the most important part of a building and uh, the cupola needs to make the list. And at, at the time, I naively didn't, didn't share that opinion. I, I was thinking more about science and laboratories and airlocks and things. And so when I went up and saw the cupola on my second flight, I realized how right my big sister was because the cupola was just amazing. And as a ro robotic operator, I sat in the cupola for much, much of my two weeks up on the space station. We actually spent about 14 days up there. There are kind of long shuttle missions attached to the space station in Endeavor. And what an amazing sight. The photos just don't do the world justice. We live on such a beautiful planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so thankful uh, that I got to, to look out the cupola. So I'll shut up. I'm jealous. Well, I'm jealous of you because you look so young. <laughs> I'm jealous of both you know, of them. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, Dan went, to, he was a shuttle guy when I was just cutting my teeth as an astronaut. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and he went on one of those early expeditions. I hadn't been there, but a couple of years. And so um, anyway, Dan still looks like he's about 49 and it's really annoying, but. Well, I am, I am one year older than ARCS. I just need to point that out. I am one year older than ARCS Foundation, so. <laughs> Well, this would be a good time to ask a question I've just been sent, which is somebody's asking, Dan, did you have any residual physical problems from your record-breaking time on ISS? And um, perhaps, perhaps you are reversing time and you're getting younger every day. Perhaps that's the, uh, the, the effect space had on you. But, um, but answering it seriously, too, is there anything that um, after all that time in space that you really had to deal with up, either up there or coming back that was quite a, a physical issue for you? Yeah, so... Um... I did the calculation in, in relativity, and I think I, I'm, I'm actually three microseconds younger than my um, than my theoretical twin uh, on on Earth. Uh, not much. Um, now there is there still is a, a an issue with bone loss. So uh, most astronauts uh, lose about one to one and a half percent of their bone density, mostly in the hip area or upper trochanter. Uh, of the body uh, every month that they're up there. So I lost about 10% of my bone density and I was basically considered osteopenic when I came back uh, from space. Now, fortunately through um, the trainers that helped us when we came back and, and a lot of uh, therapy, I was, I was pretty much back to normal after six, after six months on the earth. So it, you lose it very, you lose it uh, fairly quickly, although you can uh, regain it. And that's the, that's the issue is that why do elderly people lose their bone density and they aren't able to regain it? So that's one of the things that we have to fix. And it, it's, I think it's a, a big issue for going to Mars. It'd be a shame to spend six to nine months going to Mars and then you're not, you're not strong enough you know, to walk <laughs> yeah. on the surface of Mars. So that, that's a big issue there. Um, and then it was it was interesting. There was one there was one thing that I and this is just kind of uh, anecdotal, but I, I I remember driving a car and they encouraged us not to drive a car, but you know I wanted to drive a car. So I came after I came back, I drove a car, and and uh, what I noticed is that my my vision was more focused on looking far away think about it when you're inside space station you're you're either focused on a screen or you're focused at infinity 200 miles away uh and then but driving a car there's many instances where you have to focus let's say 50 feet away or or a little bit closer so that was one one uh thing that i noticed the the other thing uh is more psychological and, and i think i became more more of an introvert when I came back because I remember after spending six and a half months with just two other people except for a short visit from from the shuttle but uh spending that much time with two other people and then we go to the welcome ceremony at Ellington and there's thousands of people there in the crowd I was like whoa what are all these people you know it, wow. it just was really strange I mean that that's all I can describe it as. So it, it just was a, a, a big difference that way. That is so absolutely I, I, fascinating, yeah. the psychological side of it. Go so ahead, I've Fox. pulled it over because I, I have a good signal here and there's a little light. So, and plus I was, I, I made a little headway and now I'm, I'd, I'd like to t chime in on, on Dan's points. Mm -hmm. So Dano, uh, so we tested ProLea up in, on the space station. The, the, uh, um, the microgravity environment allows us to study uh, using animals like rodents. Uh, we can have otherwise very healthy rodents, but they're, they become quickly osteoporotic. And so they're great models to, to test drugs on. And there have been some great advances in muscle, wa muscle uh, wasting and, and bone loss, muscle atrophy and bone loss uh, in, the, in those studies on the space station. Hmm. So and uh, unlike Dan, my flights were shorter, but there were other health effects. Uh, for me, I grew taller. I'm a kind of a, a, a smaller, shorter guy anyway. I'm barely five foot nine on a chiropractor traction table, and I grew almost to be six foot tall. And mm -hmm. so that affected my back uh, mm -hmm. and, and my neck. And so uh, 
in a, as a as a fighter pilot, most fighter pilots have pulled a lot of G's, and our backs are in pretty bad shape. But it was a challenge to me to to be longer uh, it, uh, in in outer space. Another thing that is affected is eyesight, and people have eyesight that has shifted three diopters. Uh, with me, my eyes actually got better, and I was trying to tell my boss I needed to get a third shuttle flight. Uh, or a third space flight because my eyes got better. But anyway, that they they were they were testing eyesight at the very end of the shuttle program and into the the space station um, missions that followed because of the significant um, eye changes and they really didn't have a good explanation for it. I think they're better understanding it now. But so the space station is not only a great uh, scientific laboratory to understand the human body and long duration space flight. But it also we made advances in, in uh, microbiology uh, um, and uh, technology and a lot of other things that you can't test here on the Earth in an atmosphere and under a one g gravity field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll second the eyesight. I, I I didn't mention that, but that was something I noticed when I got up there, and I actually borrowed Frank Culbertson's uh, reading glasses because I was like, all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't, I can't read the screen like I was used to. So obviously there was some physiological changes in the shape of my eyeball when, when I got up there. And it's, it, I think it's a, I didn't notice it earlier in, in my flights, but I think it was just as you get older, if you're close to that 40 something age where, you're, where your eyesight starts changing, um, it's, uh, it's impacted more in, um, in microgravity. Thanks, Fox. Fascinating stuff. I'm just, I'm just imagining a cop pulling up behind Box right now. Like, what are you doing, sir? Well, I'm, I'm talking about space rats I work with. You know, I mean, this, you, you, you might not get to the end of your drive if you, if you admit that. Um, we're having some great questions coming in. I want to get to some of those too, but I want to get Ed to that's working on some fascinating stuff. You know, we also with Dan and, and Box, we have two robot arm operators with us. And so there's that whole human robot interaction. But some of the stuff you've been doing more recently, Ed, is, is taking it to the next level from that Hubble stuff that you oversaw and trained on, you're now working, as I understand it, on some of the robot things where robots can basically repair other robots up there. And, uh, and that sounds wonderfully futuristic. And I'm, I'd love to hear some about that. I'm sure we all would. Well, uh, it was, uh, you know, necessity. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of satellites upstairs and, uh, you know, spending 20 plus years uh, working with the uh, the women and men who went into space, particularly the ones who did the EVAs to service the the telescope, uh, we were developing uh, techniques, technologies, capabilities at Goddard to service satellites on orbit. Uh, then they retired the shuttle fleet, took away my astronauts, and uh, yeah. gave me robots instead. So at Goddard, we were working. In fact, they still are. Uh, to develop, uh, again, those technologies and capabilities to service satellites on orbit using robots uh, instead of uh, uh, people. And uh, again, there, there are so many technologies involved. It's not just putting an end effector on, on a satellite. You need to understand how things will, will move in space. You need to be able to find them in space. And so we're developing those uh, uh, navigational systems, uh, detectors, that sort of thing. So it's not just, you know, Rosie the robot uh, reaching out with her duster. It's, uh, there's a lot of planning, a lot of technology that that has to be developed. And again, it's blue sky, you know, we're faced with a problem, then come up with a fix for it. So uh, that's, that's been really interesting. I don't know if you're aware, I, I took retirement in, in August, but uh, I still stick my nose in every now and then, talk to some of the folks that are working over there. Things have slowed down with the, uh, with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, but uh, they're, they're still working at Goddard, uh, developing these, these technologies. So, um, you know, I was, uh, I laugh a lot uh, with some of the folks on JWST. We, we share our, our telescope jokes and I'm still asking them when they're going to put handrails and that sort of thing on it. But um, in fact, had a recent uh, conversation with Steve Hawley, got him laughing. He said, well, we, we don't have those 
uh, hand handrails on there because we've got no way to get to Lagrange Point Two, where the JWST is going to be sitting. Uh, my response is not yet. I mean, we're developing these te technologies. We're you know looking at developing the spacecraft that's going to take us from here to Mars. We ought to be able to get to L two. So. Uh, yeah, the, there's some wonderful stuff going on in the world of robotics. Uh, the uh, the lab at Goddard is a, kind of a cool place to work. Uh, the, uh, the, the there's a lot of safety concerns that uh, don't impede us, but slow us down sometimes. I, I look at some of the work that's going on in robotics, you know, all over the planet. I mean, man, they've got uh, you know, bipeds that can jump over logs and boxes and climb stairs and stuff. So we're getting there. We're getting there. And like I mentioned, there's there's a lot of stuff to clean up upstairs. There's, uh, you know, uh, using the Hubble as an example. Uh, we had a life expectancy of 10, maybe 15 years when we launched in 1990. And because we have been able to, to reach the telescope, because we have been able to send women and men into space to service the telescope, we've expanded that. Uh, we celebrated 31 years this, this year of, of observation. And she's, she's still bringing science back, right? But, uh, you know, the analogy I, I like to use uh, when it comes to servicing uh, uh, satellites uh, is a car running out of gas. You know, you pull off to the side of the road. You don't call an automobile manufacturer to build another vehicle. Um, you fill it up. You find a way to get gas to it. So it makes a lot of sense, you know, uh, to go up and service these satellites when, you know, launching a satellite masses everything. And uh, so they only take the amount of uh, fuel that they need to do the little tweaks uh, when they're on orbit. You got a perfectly viable satellite that's out of gas. And what do we do? We launch another satellite. So it makes a lot of sense to, to me anyway, to take uh, the, the capabilities, the technologies that we've learned fr from putting uh, the ISS together on orbit from uh, servicing not only the, the Hubble telescope, but solar max back in 84. Uh, we know how to do these things. So, so let's do them. And this is, the, this is what NASA should be about. You know, we've uh, uh, certainly the, the work that uh, Box and Dan and their colleagues have done is important and it's got its benefit, but we've been hanging out in low earth orbit now for, oh, well, for a long time. And so it's, uh, it's, and this may be your segue, uh, into commercialization, but it's nice to be able to pass that baton off to uh, the commercial sector to do the more uh, routine, if, if I could use that word, you know, uh, uh, routine tasks and routine jobs and get NASA back to doing exploration. I'm going to take your segue and run with it there. Thank you. Um, that is amazing stuff, but it is hey, very uh, important. Francis, to, uh, before you yeah. segue, before you segue hey. I, I just wanted to make a, a, a comment uh, of, that Ed uh, on, on, I wanted to piggyback on something that Ed said that, that um, resonated with me. And that's the, the, the robots that we have on the Martian surface are a great example for us because those ro robots outlive their lives by tenfold their their planned lives yep and what's interesting is those the robotic operators the ones here on the ground who who who've dedicated their entire careers to these these rovers on the moon on the mars every day is treated as their last day and that that's very interesting to me how important the rovers first have, have outperformed their expectations but is it, wouldn't it be interesting for us to, to live our lives 
by the example of the rovers on Mars. And I'll shut up. Well, that's very true. We have infested Mars with rovers, which is a wonderful problem to have. And um, so we're getting lots of great questions coming in. We're getting lots of wonderful comments about all of our speakers too. And I did want to get back to Dan at some point and talk about EVA because uh, you have your direct experience. But first, let's, uh, let's talk about commercialization because Box has a wonderful video he wanted to show share with us um, that is a kind of for our eyes only thing. This is the kind of thing that nobody else is going to get to see. And it's um, the Virgin Galactic flight. Um, some, some she was allowed to share with us just tonight, but nobody else is going to see this. Yeah, it was about two years ago. It was actually the very first commercial flight, space flight with commercial astronauts. So can you I'm see what we're seeing, music. Box? Or, no, I'm not hearing yeah, any I'm music. See can you see what we're yeah, seeing? I'm not hearing any music, but they're inside the cockpit. You'll see them go up to their suborbital flight, but it's really cool. It looks like inside of an airplane, really. But you, you'll see shortly where they get to the edge of space, right there. Ed, is this the music you play when you ride your motorcycle? <laughs> I carry the music in my head. <laughs> but this this is the ride that they're now paying $450,000 for uh, for about a 10 minute flight suborbital space at Richard Branson's company, Virgin Galactic. But what's interesting is this is not a government program. This is a commercial company flying in space. Amazing to see, and thank you for sharing. And what was you know, fascinating just the other week watching um, Bill Shatner go into space just for 10 minutes, and yet he got so much of you know, what they call the overview effect of looking at a fragile planet with a tiny atmosphere that some people here experience for weeks and months and seem to get just as much out of it. It's, it's amazing. But um, we have so much we could get through, but we're coming up. We have about 10 minutes left until we've been here for an hour. And I do want to ask Dan about spacewalking because we have Ed here who is training. We have Fox here who was um, watching people and helping people put modules and the AMF and all kinds of cool stuff on the space station. But Dan, you were, you were outside. You were, you were riding the train from the outside, which I'd love to hear some of those lessons learned, but also that perennial, what was it like question? Because that never gets old. Yeah, so um, uh, I have to say that, that the spacewalk was very, the training that we had when, when we train in, in the pool and, and uh, uh, and Ed has a lot of um, experience with that and in helping train all the astronauts and working with different tools and in the pool. And there are some differences when you're, when you're upside down the pool, you feel like you're upside down, um, but they try to represent or replicate what it's like to feel in feel in, in space and they did a I mean to me I just felt like I was another training run really other than the when I was upside down the blood didn't rush to my head uh, like it did in the pool. Um, I, I also have to say that uh, we were ahead of the timeline. So my first spacewalk was actually in a Russian spacesuit. Oh, that's the, that's the one thing I wanted to point out was that one of the benefits that you get from a rush from an international program, is that you get built-in redundancy because other other countries build hardware, and you know if you have some generic failure with your software or hardware, the other country probably doesn't have that, and they have another uh, suit that you can wear. Because a lot of people said, well, "Why do you have two spacesuits on space station?" Well, for redundancy. And after Columbia, it was a good thing we did because the U.S. spacesuits weren't really meant to stay up there for a long time. They're supposed to come back and be reserviced. So we got built-in redundancy for having an international program. So that's a benefit that a lot of people don't, don't think about. Um, but when we were ahead of the timeline in the, in the Orlon spacesuit, and I was, I was uh, uh, Yuri was our commander, is also charge of, of the uh, spacewalk that we did. And, um, and so it, it was usually for the first time spacewalking, they want you to go out during the day 
for some reason, maybe it's just, you know, they don't want you to go out at night and be scared. I don't, I don't know why, but whatever. <laughs> so Yuri said divide, which means let's go. And so we opened the hatch and, and I, I mean, I'll tell you my first grip on that handrail was just like, I could squeeze the juice out of my glove. I was just like holding on for dear life. But then when I convinced myself that, oh, okay, nothing happened. I'm still okay. And, and um, so I was fine. And, and what's interesting, I'll out myself to everybody here, but um, I'm actually scared of heights. And maybe it's a, maybe it's just a scared of fall and being a fear of falling or something, but I didn't have that that fear when I was in space. I, a lot of people said you might have this fear of falling when you get go out the hatch. I didn't have that at all, but I have it all the time here on Earth. If I go over a bridge that has like grading on the bottom, I'm like driving and not going to look down. So it was really a weird kind of sense of comfort being in the suit. And I think it, it speaks for the training too, of all the training that we did and the practice and knowing that if you just take your time, uh, my my grandmother had a, had an expression. She she always said, uh, "The faster I go, the behind her I get." So in spacewalking, you just take your time. You think about where what your is your next move and going to do that. Again, uh, shout out to Ed and and the people that trained us in how to work work in that uh, environment. Um, so uh, and then the only I'll add another little story when I came back. So the Russian uh, working with the Russians work a different way in their spacesuits. So they don't have they don't have a, a retractable tether like we use on the U.S. spacesuit. They don't have like a little wire that uh, when you walk your dog, some of the people have a retractable leash. They don't they don't have that on the Russian spacesuit. You just have you just have two tethers, and you're responsible for moving those tethers. And at the end of the spacewalk, I was kind of tired. And uh, so I, I'm, I, it was kind of a long gap between the last handhold and where we, where we got to the um, airlock. And I remember uh, going to the airlock, attaching my, my, te my one tether, and then I looked back to get my second tether and it was floating free. So for a short <laughs> period of time, there was only one hand holding me on to space station. And at the time, we didn't have a safer. We didn't have like a little a jet pack that we could wear that we would fly back to space station, which is different than doing a spacewalk on a shuttle because a shuttle, no big, no big deal. They come and get you. They drive and get you. The space station can't drive and get you if, if you if you release. So that was a that was an eye opening moment where even with all the training, I got tired and I just forgot about the one tether. And so that was a little bit of a surprise. Well, I'm glad you're down here and not still up there. My goodness, that oh. and, and thank you for sharing these thoughts. This is it's amazing. And well, thank goodness you're scared of heights because that can save your life. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. If you're driving over a okay. bridge and it, you feel scared, that's probably a very good, healthy feeling to have. Um, we're coming up on the hour, and I know that you know Box is driving, and 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 your some of your questions have already been answered, um, which is wonderful. There was a question about what you do for about spare parts, and with the um, redundancy of spacesuits, that's kind of been answered, which is great. But I wanted to try and wrap up um, the main segment here, talk about legacy, um, because as we talked about, Ed, you were there from the very beginning of the program. Dan, you've been in that sort of that comfortable middle section. And Box, you were on the penultimate shuttle mission, you know, putting up the AMF and all kinds of other um, final touches that were very dear to my heart. And thank goodness you did that. Um, Box, do you want to start by telling us what, what you think we should learn from the shuttle program that's going to be very relevant to the new programs going forward and the future of space? Well, I think the evolution is inevitable. Um, by the way, Dan, I'm on a bridge right now, just, just so you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> no, I'm in the middle of nowhere, uh, south of uh, south of Dallas, but not yet to the interstate. So it's it's pretty dark out here. I'm just going slow. Just making progress here. I got to eat dinner and my wife will kill me if I get back home past midnight. But I would say that the evolution of space flight uh, is inevitable to go to the commercial world. Just like airplanes uh, became commercial, uh, other vehicles on the, on the earth uh, and under the seas and in the air have, have gone commercial, uh, so, so will be space flight. And uh, it was interesting last summer where we saw not one, not two, but three competing commercial companies all uh, you know, competing for the tourist market. And so when you start having tourism in, in outer space, and there's more than just those three, uh, 
we're, we're, we are really making advances. And these companies, these new space companies, they progress at such a rapid pace compared to the traditional uh, contractors like Lockheed, which I'm a part of. So I think it's exciting. I think it's going to be an interesting next decade or two. Uh, we're going to find more and more uh, business cases for flying in space. And, uh, and it's becoming a, a value proposition for these, for these new companies. That's, that's fascinating stuff. And you're, you're right there in the middle of it, of course, too. Um, now, I don't know uh, we, how hard and fast we're going to be about keeping this to the hour. And of course, you know, our guests have got other things to do. But Dan and Ed, if you have any other thoughts about legacy that you can share with us quickly, I, I would love to hear them. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, let me jump in real quick. Uh, you know, I remember back in um, uh, 76 when I first got started and we were working on the shuttle program. Um, <clears throat> there were a bunch of graybeards uh, around, uh, the guys from Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, and they were always telling us this is, this is how we did it back then. And, uh, and now I are a gray beard. <laughs> uh, and what's been exciting for me is how that, uh, that culture, I feel, has changed. Uh, it's, it's been fun for me watching the new generation of engineers come in with all the talents and all the, the new uh, knowledge that they bring to the table and the imagination that uh, some of these folks have. And that's, uh, to me, that's where the legacy is. You know, uh, look forward, be young in your thinking, uh, be blue sky in your thinking. Uh, I've seen some, some wonderful, wonderful creativity, uh, you know, trying to, uh, to solve a problem in space on orbit during an EVA. And it's been my experience that it's not the gray beards that are saving the day. It's, it's the young the young blood that's coming in and bringing what they are uh, uh, creating in the, the classroom and making it real uh, in space. So that's the legacy to me is uh, it's the future. Very true. Thank you. I mean, it, it, it amazes me when I go to Houston and there are kids there. They look like kids to me, at least, and they're working in mission control. And they've never known a day when there's not been somebody in space because of the space station has always been occupied. It's like you've never known a day when people are everybody on the planet is back on the planet. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So, Dan, do you have any uh, thoughts for us, too, on, uh, on legacy? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the shuttle was just I mean, it was a workhorse. I mean, it could it could pretty much carry anything with, that would fit in its payload bay, which was roughly 15 feet by 50 feet, um, had a payload capacity of about 60,000 pounds, I believe, um, rough number. It's very versatile. I mean, think of all the different missions that the shuttle did between um, uh, space lab, repair missions, to carrying different pieces up to space. You could always argue, well, there's other ways to get pieces of things up into space, but just, it was just a very versatile uh, mach machine. So that to me is um, what I, I just think. And, and in the future, I think we'll have something similar, but um, it'll be a, it might be a ways. Well, thank you so much. And I think I, I speak for everybody here and that the, the things that you, you did as a trio are just remarkable. You basically advanced humanity in ways that uh, we all need it, and your, the continuing work you're all doing is just remarkable. Um, and of course, everybody on this call is doing the same thing with these young kids, with ARCS, getting um, kids through college, the next generation of STEM, doing those scientists, doing those engineers, getting them into those positions. Everybody here is doing something remarkable, and thank goodness for everybody supporting this incredible institution. Um, we are out of time, and I know that people have got lots of questions, but there's lots of different ways of reaching these folks. You can see Ed give presentations normally at Space Fest every year. You can um, catch up with Dan and the programs he's doing with Debbie Rayford, as I understand, and um, Box and I both work for Higher Orbits. We're doing programs around the country, um, working with kids to create 
create little um, designs and things and go on to the space station, all kinds of experiments. So um, each of these folks are doing wonderful things con continually and can share their experiences elsewhere. And the fact we are leaving this with so many unanswered questions, I think is a positive because that means we could, we could be here all night, but uh, I feel like we should wrap up and uh, not take any more of their valuable time. Thank you so much to the three of you for, for everything you've done for, for the planet and everything you've done for us tonight. Thank you, Francis. Thanks. Nice work. It's been Thank a pleasure. You. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Francis. I can't, can't tell you how much this means. Thank you for joining us all tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you all and a big hand. Yeah. Aloha. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs> Aloha. Yeah. Aloha. Big <laughs> <Like> five box. <laughs> Bye. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.